Part three, chapter three of the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One, by Edward Tyus Cook. Chapter three, enforcing a report. August to December of 1857. The nation is grateful to you for what you did at Scutari, but all that it was possible for you to do there was a trifle compared with the good you are doing now. Sir John McNeil, Letter to Florence Nightingale, December 1857. Reformers, who are familiar with the ways of the political world, more often sigh than rejoice when they hear that a subject in which they are interested has been referred to a royal commission. They know that the chances are many to one that the subject, like the report, will be placed on a shelf and stay there. Sometimes the reference is a well-understood euphemism for such an intention, and even when it is not, there are many things which may bring about the same result. The commission will perhaps produce a litter of reports from whose discordant voices no definite conclusion can be drawn. In any case, the report or reports will have to engage the earnest attention of his or her majesty's government, and the attention, earnest or otherwise, is sure to be prolonged. Before the process has come to an end, many things may have happened to overlay the subject in question. Every generation of reformers sees a certain number of subjects on which its heart has been set deeply and turned under a pile of blue books. This was the danger with which Mr. Herbert and Miss Nightingale were confronted in August 1857 in the case of their royal commission on the sanitary condition of the British Army. Against the risk of an equivocal report, they had, indeed, guarded themselves in advance, but the danger of a definite report leading to no immediate action had still to be met. Mr. Herbert was no less anxious than Miss Nightingale to meet it. He had devoted unsparing toil to the commission. His toil would be reduced to futility if the report were merely to be pigeonholed. They laid their plans on the consideration mentioned at the end of the last chapter, namely the effect which the disclosures of the Royal Commission was likely to have on public opinion. Mr. Herbert communicated the gist of the report privately to Lord Panmure. It could be officially presented and published sooner or later as the negotiations with ministers might go. Mr. Herbert pointed out to Lord Panmure that the report was likely to arrest a good deal of general attention, that there was time to take measures toward reform before the report became known to the public, that the simultaneous publication both of its recommendations and of orders and regulations founded upon them would give the prestige which promptitude always carries with it. Mr. Herbert would gladly give every assistance in his power toward that end. He put the case with his usual suavity, but there was iron within the velvet. The publication of the report could properly be postponed for a while, but not indefinitely. Lord Panmure had to choose between committing himself to instant reform, so as to whitewash the government beforehand, and postponing reform, in which case he would have to reckon with a public opinion inflamed by the disclosures of the report. And meanwhile, Miss Nightingale still held her report in reserve for use in an appeal to public opinion should the negotiations fail to secure any guarantee for prompt reform. The plan of active reform agreed upon between her and Mr. Herbert was that four subcommissions should be appointed, with Mr. Herbert himself as chairman of each, to settle the details of a reform and in some measure to execute it in accordance with the general recommendations of the report. These subcommissions were severally, one, to put the barracks in sanitary order, two, to organize a statistical department, three, to institute a medical school, and four, to reconstruct the army medical department, to revise the hospital regulations, and draw up a warrant for the promotion of medical officers. This last, from its comprehensive and cleansing scope, was called by Miss Nightingale the Wiping Commission. Mr. Herbert sent these proposals to Lord Panmure on August 7th, and two days later he wrote to Miss Nightingale, Panmure writes fairly enough, but he has gone to shoot grouse. I have asked Alexander to meet me at the Burlington on Wednesday at three to discuss and settle things. So I have disposed of your time and rooms. 
The grouse, however, were not quite ready, and on the 14th Mr. Herbert caught Lord Panmure on the wing. Mr. Herbert seemed to carry his point. The four sub-commissions were agreed to in general terms, and as he sent word to Miss Nightingale on the same day, he was able to leave for Ireland with a lighter heart after seeing Pan. But I am not easy about you. Here am I going to lead an animal life for a month, get up early, pursue your animal, catch him, eat him, and go to sleep. Why can't you, who do men's work, take man's exercise in some shape? This is my parting sermon. I use, for the purpose of scolding you, a liberty which nothing gives me but my hearty regard and affection for you. Mr. Herbert had well earned his month's fishing, but as Dr. Sutherland presently wrote to her, one thing is quite clear, that women can do what men would not do, and that women will dare suffering knowingly where men would shrink. Miss Nightingale would not, and could not, take man's rest, because she felt her cause too intensely. She could not be of so light a heart as her friend, because she knew her pan a little better than he did. Dr. Andrew Smith, she heard, was putting up a stiff fight against reform. Lord Panmure stayed on in the Highlands late into the autumn, paying only a flying visit or two to London. His subordinates were as laborious as ever in piling up objections. He became frightened at his own acts, and at one time revoked, but afterwards under pressure reinstated, the authority he had given for the wiping subcommission. Mr. Herbert returned to England in September, and came up to London to see Miss Nightingale before the first meeting of the first subcommission. Many weeks elapsed before all of them were set on foot. She, meanwhile, was incessantly at work, and Dr. Sutherland, who lived at Highgate, was constantly with her. She wrote reminders to Lord Panmure. Although I hear you saying, there is that bothering woman again, she begged Mr. Herbert to do the like. She drafted instructions and schemes for each of the subcommissions, as each of them set to work, there were meetings in her rooms to settle the procedure. There were periods, as Miss Nightingale afterward recalled, when Sidney Herbert would meet the cabal, as he used to call it, which consists of you and me and Alexander and Sutherland, and sometimes Martin and Farr, every day either at Burlington Street or at Belgrave Square, and sometimes as often as twice or even three times a day. A few extracts from her correspondence will show the extent of her work and the eagerness of her temper. August 7th, Miss Nightingale to Sir J. McNeil. The reconstitution of the Army Medical Department as to its government has been carried by the Commission almost in the form which you recommended. I have been requested by Mr. Herbert, who went out of town last night for a few days, to draw up a scheme as to what these new men are to do and I now venture to enclose it to you, earnestly begging you to consider it, and send it me back with your remarks in as short a time as you possibly can. We have carried the barracks subcommission with Panmure, Dr. Sutherland, to be the sanitary head. September 29th. Mr. Herbert to Miss Nightingale. Pan is still shooting. It is to me unconscionable. In future you must defend the bison, for I won't. October 10th. Miss Nightingale to Sir J. McNeil. I will not say a word about India. You know so much more about it than anybody here. We have seen terrible things in the last three years, but nothing to my mind so terrible as Panmure's unmanly and stupid indifference on this occasion. I have been three years serving in the War Department. When I began there was incapacity, but not indifference. Now there is incapacity and indifference, Panmure's coming up to town last Thursday week was the consequence of reiterated remonstrance, and he is going away again after the next Indian mail. That India will have to be occupied by British troops for several years, I suppose there is no question. And so far, from the all-absorbing interest of this Indian subject, diminishing the necessity of immediately carrying out the reforms suggested by our commission, I am sure you will agree that they are now the more vitally important to the very existence of an army. I came up to town, from Malvern, on Thursday week, and met Mr. Herbert for this purpose. Panmure had not done a thing. It was extracted from him then and there that the four sub-commissions should be issued immediately. The instructions had been approved by P. seven weeks ago. A week, however, has elapsed, and we have heard nothing. I shall not, however, leave P. alone till this is done. Mr. Herbert's honour is at stake, which gives us a hold upon him. Without him, of course, I could do nothing. November 9th, Sir J. McNeil to Miss Nightingale. 
we may now reckon on something being done to rescue the country from the sin and shame of having so culpably neglected our soldiers. I rejoice that you are to see the fruits of your labors in their behalf. November 15th, Miss Nightingale to Sir J. McNeil. Here I come again. Panmure has granted the wiping commission with such ample instructions for preparing draft instructions and regulations, defining the duties of, etc., etc., and revising the Queen's QMG's barracks, purveyors, and hospital regulations, as you may guess them to be, when I tell you they were written by me. Mr. Herbert is, besides, to send Panmure a constitution for the Army Medical Board, and a warrant for promotion himself. All that is necessary now is to keep Mr. Herbert up to the point. The strength of his character is its simplicity and candor, with extreme quickness of perception. Its fault is its excessive eclecticism. Ten years have I been endeavoring to obtain an expression of opinion from him, and have never succeeded yet. This new subcommission entails upon me a labor I most gladly undertake, of putting together draft regulations to be submitted to Mr. Herbert, as suggestions for the draft he will propose to the subcommission. These regulations must, of course, rhyme with the report. I think you would recommend, etc., etc., December 1st, Miss Nightingale to Sir J. McNeil. This is the first rough proof of the regulations chiefly written by myself, which Mr. Herbert will submit to the Regulations Committee on Monday. I send them to you with his sanction, begging you to cut them up severally and to send them back as soon as possible. I, in my own name, direct your particular attention to criticize the regulations for nurses. You will, of course, understand that my name does not appear. We are so sorry to give you this trouble, but feel the necessity of having your advice. December 14th. Mrs. Herbert to Miss Nightingale. Dearest, Sidney wishes me to send you these, if you will be so kind as to look over them. I know it's wrong. 2. A later letter from Sir John McNeil is quoted at the head of this chapter. He considered that compared with the work which she was doing now, what she had done at Scutari was a trifle. Mere child's play was the phrase which she herself used in making the comparison. Preceding pages will, I think, have inclined the reader to the same conclusion, or at any rate have enabled him to understand what Miss Nightingale and Sir John meant. And this large and difficult work was being done by a woman who had already taxed her physical strength dangerously in the East, and who was now threatened in the opinion of competent observers by a complete breakdown. Of the members of what was called her cabinet, Sir John McNeil was the one for whose intellectual power and judgment she had the highest respect. To Mr. Herbert she was personally the most attached. But to Dr. Sutherland also she sometimes opened her inner thoughts and feelings. He was of a somewhat wayward disposition, which alternately pleased and vexed the business-like lady-in-chief, but he was an indispensable helper, whilst in his wife Miss Nightingale inspired deep affection, and the two women interchanged intimate religious experiences. All Miss Nightingale's friends, and Dr. Sutherland as a medical man, more especially, saw that she was overworking. Change of air and seclusion she herself felt compelled to seek, and she found them at Malvern in the establishment of Dr. Johnson, who had moved thither from Umberslade. But rest from work she would not and could not take. She was at Malvern in August and September, and again in December. Her faithful Aunt May, her true mother, as the niece at this time called her, kept watch over her alike at Malvern and in London. The society of her own mother and sister, with their many and lively interests, she found distracting. Whether at the Burlington or at Malvern, she desired to use every hour of strength for her work and for nothing else and when Dr. Sutherland joined the others in begging her to desist, her heart was heavy within her. She was sore that her friend should understand her so little. She surmised that he had been prompted by her sister. She was morbidly anxious at the time that no member of the family except Aunt May should know how ill she was. She had attained her freedom for the life of independent work at a great price, as the first part of this memoir has shown. Perhaps in her present overwrought condition she was haunted by a dread lest the galling solicitude of her family might lure her back into the cage. Dr. Sutherland had written two letters at the end of August, begging her to put all work aside. 
She was thinking of everybody's sanitary improvement, he said, except her own. Pray leave us all to ourselves, soldiers and all, for a while. We shall all be the better for a rest. Even your divine pan will be more musical for not being beaten quite so much. As for Mr. Sidney Herbert, he must be in the seventh heaven. Please don't go, Dr. Gully, but do eat and drink and don't think. We'll make such a precious row when you come back. The day when you left town it appeared as if all your blood wanted renewing, and that cannot be done in a week. You must have new blood, or you can't work, and new blood can't be made out of tea, at least so far as I know. There is a paper of Dr. Christensen's about twenty-eight ounces of solid food per diem. You know where that is, and depend on it, the doctor is right. And now I have done my duty as confessor, and hope I shall find you an obedient penitent." To this letter she replied as follows, Miss Nightingale to Dr. Sutherland. And what shall I say in answer to your letter? Someone once said, He that would save his life shall lose it, and what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He meant, I suppose, that life is a means and not an end, and that soul, or the object of life, is the end. Perhaps he was right. Now, in what one respect could I have done other than I have done? Or what exertion have I made that I could have left unmade? Had I lost the report, what would the health I should have saved have profited me? Or what would ten years of life have advantaged me exchanged for the ten weeks this summer? Yes, but you say you might have walked or driven or eaten meat. Well, since we must come to Sentir della Spazira, let me tell you, O oh doctor, that after any walk or drive I sat up all night with palpitation, and the sight of animal food increased the sickness. The man here put me, as soon as I arrived, on a sofa, and told me not to move, and to take no solid food at all till my pulse came down. I remind myself of a little dog, a friend of mine, who barked himself out of an apoplectic fit, when the dog doctor did something he had always manifested an objection to. Now I have written myself into a palpitation. Do you think me one of Byron's young ladies? He it was, I think, who made a small appetite the fashion. Or do you think me an ascetic? Asceticism is the trifling of an enthusiast with his power, a puerile cocketing with his selfishness or his vanity, in the absence of any sufficiently great object to employ the first or overcome the last. Or since I am speaking to an artist, and must illustrate and not define the Cristo della Moneta, of Titian at Dresden is an ascetic. The Er ist vollbracht of Albert Dürer at Nuremberg is a Christ, he whom we call an example, though little we make of it. For our church has daubed that tender, beautiful image with coarse, bloody colors till it looks like the sign of a roadside inn and another has mysticized him out of all human reach, till he is the god and god is the devil. But are we not really to do as Christ did? And when he said, the son of man, did he not mean the sons of men? He was no ascetic. But shall I tell you what made you write to me? I have no second sight. I do not see visions nor dream dreams. It was my sister. Or rather, I will tell you that I have second sight. I have been greatly harassed by seeing my poor owl lately, without her head, without her life, without her talons, lying in the cage of your canary, like the statue of Ramses the Second, in the pool at Memphis, and the little villain pecking at her. Now that's me. I am lying without my head, without my claws, and you all peck at me. It is de rigueur de obligation, like the saying something to one's hat, when one goes into church, to say to me all that has been said to me a hundred and ten times a day during the last three months. It is the obligato on the violin, and the twelve violins all practice it together like the clock striking twelve o'clock at night all over London, till I say, like Xavier de Maistre, Azez, je la sais, je ne la sais que trop. I am not a penitent, but you are like the R.C. confessor, who says what is de rigueur, what is in his formulary to say, and never comes to the life of the thing, the root of the matter. Dr. Sutherland to Miss Nightingale, Highgate, September 7th. What can I say, my dear friend, to your long scold of a letter? You are decidedly wrong in passing yourself off for a dead owl, 
and in thinking that I have joined with other equally charitable people in pecking at you. It is I that have got all the pecking, although I hope that I am neither an owl nor dead, and your little beak is one of the sharpest. But like a good live hero, I bear it all joyfully because it is got in doing my duty to you. I want you to live, I want you to work. You want to work and die, and that is not at all fair. I admire your heroism and self-devotion with all my heart, but alas, I cannot forget that it is all within the compass of a weak, perishing body, and am I to encourage you to wear yourself in the vain attempt to beat not only men, but time? You little know what daily anxiety it has cost me to see you dying by inches in doing work fit only for the strongest constitution. Dr. Sutherland urged her to take, at any rate, a week's complete rest, but she would not. Her cause was her life, and she could not for the sake of life lose what alone made life worth living. While they were delaying, the soldiers were dying. Her work would not wait. She begged him to come down to Malvern and work with her in order that they might have everything ready to put before Mr. Herbert in London by the time he returned from his fishing. Dr. Sutherland wrote pretty excuses. Mrs. Sutherland made counter-suggestions. Why should not Miss Nightingale stay on at Malvern altogether? Would not Mr. Herbert, she wrote, September 11th, go to you for a few days, settle all the points, and then communicate daily by letter? You have so much tact that you would be able to maintain your influence. Do think, if this be possible. It is quite against my own interest to desire it, for if you come to London I may get a glimpse of your dear face. But Miss Nightingale persisted, and Dr. Sutherland surrendered. He went down to Malvern, was himself ill there, and Miss Nightingale reported progress of the sick baby to his wife. But the two invalids, we may be sure, talked of other things than their ailments. 3. So little was Miss Nightingale in a mood to succumb to her physical weakness that she had offered to go out to India, where her friend Lady Canning was at the Viceroy's side during the mutiny. "'Miss Nightingale has written to me,' wrote Lady Canning to her mother, November 14th. "'She is out of health and at Malvern, but she says she would come at twenty-four hours' notice if I think there is anything for her to do in her line of business.' I think there is not anything here, for there are few wounded men in want of actual nursing, and there are plenty of native servants and assistants who can do the dressings. Only one man, who was very ill of dysentery, has died since we went to the hospital a fortnight ago. The up-country hospitals are too scattered for a nursing establishment, and one could hardly yet send women up. Miss Nightingale was very serious in the offer, for she had made it twice, first through Mr. Herbert, and then in a personal letter carried by her cousin, Major Nicholson, who had been ordered to India at this time. She thought of herself as a soldier in the ranks, and, absorbed intently though she was in her work for the army at home, she would have considered active service in the field a superior call. Had the Viceroy felt the need of accepting Miss Nightingale's offer, it is possible that her power of will and the excitement of activity might have carried her through the ordeal, but she had barely strength for the work on which she was already engaged. Of her daily life during this period, at Malvern and in London successively, her sister's letters give a vivid description. Lady Verney to Madame Mole, September 1857. The accounts of Eth have been very anxious, and May says she does not sleep above two hours in the night, and continues most feverish and feeble, and cannot eat. She never left that room where you saw her, was scarcely off her sofa for a month. Now she goes down for half an hour into a parlor to do business with the commissioner who has been there to see her. Aunt May says it throws her back more to put off work for the cause she lives for than to do a little every day, so we reconcile ourselves. Tuesday, she says, was a very uneasy day, and F. said she felt as she had done when recovering from the fever at Balaclava. Still both doctors say there is no disease, that it is only entire exhaustion of every organ from overwork, and that rest will alone restore her. Rest for much longer than she will give herself, I fear. She has two packs a day. This is all the water curing. It seems to bring down the pulse, and she lies at the open window the chief part of the day, not reading or writing, only just still. She cannot be better anywhere. No one can get at her. 
Aunt May is a dragon, and the commissioner is the only person who has seen her. Aunt M says, I cannot disguise to myself that she is in a very precarious state. Lady Verney to M. Mole, December 5th, 1857. Aunt May's bulletin is generally the same. Mr. Herbert for three hours in the morning, Dr. Sutherland for four hours in the afternoon, Dr. Balfour, Dr. Farr, Dr. Alexander interspersed. They are drawing up the new regulations, but this you must not tell. F. is as nervous of being known to have anything to do with it as other people are of getting honor. Dr. Sutherland burst out to Aunt May the other day that F.'s clearness and strength of mind, her extraordinary powers, her grasp of intellect and benevolence of heart struck him more and more as he worked with her, that no one who did not see her proved and tried as he did could conceive the extent of both. The most gifted of God's creatures, he called her, and the determined way in which she will not let any one know what she is about is so curious. She will not even tell us, we only hear it from these men. She is killing herself with work, which they all say no one else can do, no one else has the threads of it or the perseverance for it, and yet no one will ever know it. Others will have all the credit of the very things she suggested and introduced, at the cost, one may say, of life and comfort of all kinds, for it is an intolerable life she is leading, lying down between whiles to enable her just to go on, not seeing her nearest and dearest, because with her breath so hurried, all talking must be spared except what is necessary, and all excitement that she may devote every energy to the work. And May says again today how Mr. Herbert is in sometimes twice a day, and Dr. Sutherland the whole day, but please don't tell anyone. Because she alone can give facts which no one else hardly possesses, because she knows the bearings of the whole which no one else has followed, has both the smallest details at her fingers' ends and the great general views of the whole, what is to be gained and what avoided. While Miss Nightingale was lying ill at Malvern, she was being courted in counterfeit at Manchester. Her parents and sister were visiting Manchester to see the Art Treasures exhibition, and the newspapers had included Florence in the party. The sightseers, wrote Lady Verney, took Lady Newport, a very sweet-looking woman in black, for Florence, and treated her like a saint in the Middle Ages. Let me touch your shawl only, they said, as they crowded around, or let me stroke your arm. Mrs. Gaskell told me we could have no idea how deep the feeling is for you in the hearts of the people. The feeling would perhaps have been yet deeper if the people had known the work which Miss Nightingale was still doing, and the delicate health from which she was suffering. At the end of 1857, she thought that death might overtake her in the middle of her work with Sidney Herbert, and she wrote this letter to him, to be sent when I am dead. 30. Old Burlington Street, November 26, 1857. Dear Mr. Herbert, 1. I hope you will not regret the manner of my death. I know that you will be kind enough to regret the fact of it. You have sometimes said that you were sorry you had employed me. I assure you that it has kept me alive. I am not sorry to stay alive to do the nurses, but I can't help it. Lord, here I am, send me, has always been religion to me. I must be willing to go now as I was to go to the east. You know, I always thought it the greatest of your kindnesses sending me there. Perhaps he wants a sanitary officer now for my Crimeans in some other world where they are gone. Two, I have no fears for the army now. You have always been our Cid, the true chivalrous sort, which is to be the defender of what is weak and ugly and dirty and undefended, rather than of what is beautiful and artistic. You are so now, more than ever, for us. Us means, in my language, the troops and me. 3. I hope you will have no chivalrous ideas about what is due to my memory. The only thing that can be due to me is what is good for the troops. I always thought thus while I was alive, and I am not likely to think otherwise now that I am dead. Whatever your own judgment has accepted from me will come with far greater force from yourself. Whatever your own judgment has rejected would come with no force at all. 4. What remains to be done has, however, already been sanctioned by your judgment. First, as to Army Medical Council, Army Medical School, General Hospital Scheme, Gymnastics. Second, as to what Dr. Sutherland must needs do for the sanitary branch, 
and third as to colonial barracks canadian mediterranean west and east indian five i am very sorry about the nursing scheme it seems like leaving it in the lurch mrs shaw stewart is the only woman i know who will do for superintendent of army nurses believe me ever while i can say god bless you yours gratefully f nightingale then she asked her uncle to assist in her making a will she was anxious about the nightingale fund the management of which she had not yet been able to devote attention she proposed to leave it to st thomas's hospital the property to which she would ultimately be entitled upon the death of her father and mother she proposed to apply to the building of a model barrack according to her ideas that is with day rooms for the men separate places to sleep in like jeb's asylum at fulham lavatories gymnastic places reading rooms etc not forgetting the wives but having a kind of model lodging house for the married men in a letter of instructions to her uncle she named sir john mcneil mr herbert and dr sutherland as the men who would best carry out such a plan she included a few family bequests but what was nearest to her heart at this time was to leave personal keepsakes to mrs herbert and other friends who had worked for her long and faithfully for this purpose in order that there might be no question about possession she begged her sister to send up to london from embley various goods and chattels which had personal associations with herself and she had one other wish it related to her children the associations with our men she wrote to her sister december eleventh amount to me what i never should have expected to feel a superstition which makes me wish to be buried in the crimea absurd as i know it to be for they are not there end of part three chapter three enforcing a report